Oklahoma, when you look at them through three weeks, some mixed results, offensively, some issues. What what has stood out to you about the Sooners from what we've seen from them so far in 2024? I think their defense is good. Uh, mm -hmm. We thought that coming in. Uh, you know, they, they've got more depth on the defensive line. Adding Dominic Williams helps. Jaden Jackson's yeah. been a really impressive true freshman. You know, R. Mason Thomas finally came on last week against Tulane. I thought he stepped up and played really well down the stretch. They need him to be a quality pass rusher, but – you got a lot of depth at linebacker. Danny Stutzman, he, he is a dude. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy's playing at a, a big time, you know, all American caliber level right now. And in the back end of the defense, you got some really good players at safety. Billy Bowman kind of highlights that. I, I like your front end players over at corner. Uh, Kanai Walker has been a really nice addition the last couple of years. They added a guy, Des Malone, from San Diego State. So, like, the defense that you feel good about, like, that's, mm -hmm. that's score, 10 takeaways so far on the season. They're doing a good job limiting, you know, ball carriers. That's going to be a real key in this Tennessee matchup, which we'll get to. But mm -hmm. they're going to have to stop Dylan Sampson and Tennessee from running the football and do it without overly extending themselves and bringing too many people in the box. And then offensively, which is what you really want to ask about. I mean, come on. <laughs> just ask me about the offense. Just say it. Just say it. Is this offense broke? Because that's what everybody kind of wants to know. They've been really banged up. You know, yeah. I don't want to make excuses, but I want to be real. You know, mm -hmm. they lost five starters from a year ago on the offensive line. And mm -hmm. you go get a Branson Hickman from SMU. He's only played about 10 plays so far this season. You know, you go get a Garen Hatchett from, from Washington, and now he's had surgery, and he's likely done for the season. You know, your right tackle, Jake Taylor's played about a total of a half in three games. You're mixing, matching, having guys in there. You got a redshirt freshman at center who's really your fourth you know, got your depth chart. You've got a, a left tackle you had to start last week as a redshirt freshman. He's probably not ready to play. So mm -hmm. I think they're going to get some of those guys back this week. That's been part of the problem. Just so much inexperience and guys that really you're not ready to play these guys yet. They've mm -hmm. got a chance to get players at some point. So that's been a little bit of an issue. Uh, wide receiver similar. You lose Jaden Gibson in fall camp for the year. You lose Jalil Farouk in the first half of your first yeah. game for four to six weeks. You haven't seen Nick Anderson, who had 10 touchdown receptions as a freshman last year. So, you know, three of your top four receivers have been absent so far. Um, and, and, you know, you're at least hopeful you can get Nick Anderson back this week. You can get Jalil Farouk at some point because they need someone besides Deion Burks. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, just, they just don't have – the guys that can, you know, really put fear in a defense and stretch the field, which is kind of combining with their inabilities to run the football. And then lastly, you know, Jackson Arnold has kind of been up and down. Yeah. You know, he's, he, he's been okay to this point. But I think mm -hmm. there's been opportunities that, for whatever reason, he hasn't pulled the trigger. And they're trying to instill some confidence in him, made some really nice plays with his legs last week. I think that will continue to be something that they look to try to, to utilize is his athleticism and playmaking as a runner. But he's got a big time arm, and I, I'd, I'd like to see more of that, more vertical throws. You know, making the defense play back, play off, and yeah. really pushing the football down the field to create some explosive plays. So we haven't seen a lot of that so far this year. And boy, Saturday night will be a timely time for Seth Patrell and this offense to, to uncork some plays. Yeah, you know, this is a compelling game just for football reasons. These are two really interesting teams. You've got, you know, like I said, Jackson Arnold, Nico, two first-year starters that people are trying to have a lot of expectation. People are trying to find out if they're yeah. dudes. But the off-the-field stuff is obviously going to be a, a talking point. Josh Heupel, one of the favorite sons of Bob Stoops, yeah. wins the national championship with him. I don't, it, he wasn't, like, officially the coach in waiting, but I think there was definitely some designs there until there yep. wasn't. Uh, That's what – let me just let me just stop real quick. I think that even as a former player and being around the program at the time, that was my expectation. Yeah. No one told, no one told me that. Yeah. I don't know if there was ever like a conversation, but like everyone just expected, like, I mean, Josh is producing Eisman trophy winners. He's taking over the offense. He's naturally the next guy. I think that was the feeling former players and, and the fan base had around that entire situation. Mm hmm. You know, I think it's hard to not take those things personally, but Bob, but uh, Josh has been pretty quiet about his time at Oklahoma. You know, I think certainly, you know, 
the way I think he would tell you that he would probably felt a little bit restricted by what he could do offensively in that 14 season, the way that that yep. season ended in the, in the Russell athletic bowl, the Clemson game. And then for, for Bob to kind of bring in Lincoln and, and hand him over the, the reins, let him kind of do whatever. I think that there was some frustration there, but Josh has been really quiet about his time. You, you when you talk to people that, that, that obviously played with Josh and, and uh, you know, played under Josh and the people around the Oklahoma program, how is he viewed now? You know, it's been a decade since he's been associated with the program, but still a guy that, you know, won the last national championship there. What, what, how does, how is he viewed? He's appreciated, respected. And I know that, and, and I know Josh well, and I know that former players, teammates, and people around the, you know, that I know are happy for all the success he's having. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that he's, He's talked about in the highest regard. He's respected and at the highest. I mean, I think he's one of the most important players in the history of Oklahoma football. Yeah. That, that's how I view Josh Heupel. Um, And, you know, I, I also think to his credit, you know, it's interesting. Things happen for a reason, right? Is Josh Heupel as good a coach today if what happened didn't happen? Maybe he is, but maybe he's not. Mm-hmm. Because I can tell you that fueled him. Yeah, that fueled him one hundred percent. He changed his offense. Yeah, he went and added more offense to it. What you see now at Tennessee is was not at all what he was running no. at Oklahoma. Even at Utah State, his one year after right. the Oklahoma year, they weren't running that. You know, that was, no. this was something he brought with him to Mizzou. So yeah, mm-hmm. correct. So like you know, and and I just and I'm just so happy Josh had the success. But like you know, he he wanted to go prove that he was much more than you know, the end there at Oklahoma and that mm-hmm. he could get it done and he could get it right. And to his credit, he went and he worked and he grinded and did an excellent job at Missouri, did an excellent job at UCF. And I think it goes without question what he inherited to where Tennessee football is at. Yeah. I, I don't know if anybody's given him the credit or due that he truly deserves because with what second year, he takes a program that had been run off into the ditch to an 11 win season and winning a, a New Year's six game. So mm-hmm. he, and, and now he's got his best team right here in front of him. So I'm just mm-hmm. unbelievably happy for him. And, and the fact that he took a real negative in his life and he's now turned it into this amazing positive. And now he gets a chance to bring this team back into Norman, Oklahoma, as Oklahoma <laughs> kicks off their, their SEC, yeah. uh, you know, status and, and just to see exactly where they're at and so many people will be judging is Oklahoma ready for the SEC. And this is that litmus test. Uh, and, and boy, uh, with all the fanfare and, and college game day going to be there, Herbie and Fowler and ABC primetime. It's just, the stakes are so high. The, mm-hmm. the lights are going to be shining so bright. And I, I got to imagine Josh feels really good about the team he's, he's bringing into Norman. So I, I, I look at it like this. I mean, Oklahoma fans don't want Josh Heupel to win this game. They obviously want their <laughs> team to win yeah. this game. But I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of uh, appreciation and, you know, just probably, you know, a lot of emotions, I think, on Saturday night there in Norman, reflecting, mm-hmm. thinking about what Josh has meant to that program. And obviously, once that ball is kicked and Toe meets leather, it's going to change a little bit. And, and you're going to have, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, both these, these two teams going after a victory. I think Josh is one of those guys in the coaching profession that's like easy to root for. You know, you talk to coaches, you can get a pretty good sense of like there's there's coaches who win and people respect them, but they don't really like them and like find them kind of distasteful. And then there's there's coaches who, you know, win or whatever. There there's sort of two uh, scales that you're graded on. And I think I've talked to enough coaches over the last, you know, 15, 20 years I've been covering this, this sport. I've never heard a coach say a negative word about Josh, like at all. Uh, I think he treats people well. And I think when you go back to how he's viewed at Oklahoma, I, I think that that's sort of echoed in that in how he's remembered in the program versus other coaches who don't treat people, don't treat people well. And I think that some of that, some of that informs a lot of that, despite, you know, besides even what he did on the field as a player and on the field um, as a coach, I think. Well, he's a good person, uh, first and foremost. He's about the right stuff. Like you said, he treats people the right way, and that that takes you a long way in life, not just in coaching. Mm-hmm. But we definitely know plenty of coaches that don't 
handle themselves that way. And that's, that's just who Josh is, man. And that's why mm -hmm. he is an easy guy to root for. And, um, and I, I, again, I, I would, I can't imagine there's many people outside of maybe Kent state last week, kicking an onside kick up uh, <laughs> where you were. <laughs> maybe, they saw it on tape. That's it. The, the players make it a read. The players I, make it a read. I'm just kidding. You know what I say to that is, is, is get the onside. Like I, yeah. I, everybody, you know, everybody goes out there, prepares and, Gets yeah. ready for football games, but no, I mean I, you're right. Josh is just a good man. He's a good football coach, and uh, he's he's very well respected amongst his peers in the uh, in the coaching ranks for sure. When you look at the QBs in this game, when when you've watched Jackson Arnold closely, what are the things that that you feel like you've learned about him as a player now that he's got the full time reins? Well, he's got he's got a, a tremendous ceiling, and I think mm -hmm. you go back yeah. to the the bowl game against Arizona after the picks. A couple early picks, he he fought back and made some big time throws in that game. I think even this year, you go back to the Temple game early. There's a throw he made to Jalil Farouk, got pressure in his face, gets hit, delivers a, a dime on an over route. But I've also seen as I've watched it, and I don't I don't know exactly what it is. You know, even doing the game this past week, is it not believing in the offensive line? Is it a lack of continuity with receivers? But you know, I, I've seen him an unwillingness to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some throws there that he's left on the field. And, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think it's that he doesn't see it. I think he sees the field well enough. Um, and that's – I think that's one thing that the coaching staff's trying to bring back out of him. It, are you gun shy from the, the interceptions against, you know, Arizona in that bowl game? I mean, he's now got a couple. He's got one in each of the last couple of games. But there's just some downfield throws – that for whatever reason, he can make these throws. He's just not choosing to. He's not pulling the trigger and, and letting it rip. So that's one thing that's been interesting for me to watch because he he can make every throw. I mean, he's the preseason number one quarterback in the country coming out of high school by a lot of mm -hmm. people. I mean, him and Nico are in the same, the same class, and, and there's a lot of people that had, that had Jackson ahead of Nico. So I, I can't quite put my finger on that. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that he can because I do think that there is an extremely high ceiling that has kind of been untapped to this point so mm -hmm. far this season. And I, I think that they're, you're going to need to see some signs, some glimpses of that on Saturday night if Oklahoma is going to find a way uh, to get a victory against Tennessee. Do you think any of that might be playing games so far against teams that they're, you know, favored to win by double digits and maybe he doesn't feel like he needs to cut it loose and maybe you see a different version of him in a game that you know that you might need to score 40 points to win it? Maybe. Uh, I, you know, when I talked to him last week, he didn't voice that to me. But mm -hmm. that's possible. Uh, deep mm -hmm. down, you know, maybe, maybe that's something that he's thinking about. But, you know, boy, it sure felt like in that Houston game when you're on the ropes, you need to, you know. <laughs> Let it loose, yeah. You know, the, the time was in. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter what you were favored by. I mean, you were mm -hmm. in a 14-12 knockdown drag out uh, mm -hmm. in that football game. So uh, maybe, and, and we'll see. Uh, but I, I do know, I've seen in practice, I've seen in scrimmages, I've seen in games, him have the ability to, to make big downfield throws. I just, um, I'm anxious to see if we see that with more regularity and I think, you know, getting a guy like Nick Anderson, if he's able to come back this week, I think that that's mm -hmm. going to help him because I, I got to imagine some of it is just confidence in who you're delivering the ball to. You know, there's a mm -hmm. difference when you got a six foot four, 215 pound receiver that you just trust. If I put it up, he's going to go get it. I think that that changes your approach, changes your mindset as a quarterback when, when you do need to cut it loose and pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. You know, especially at Oklahoma, there's so much expectation on quarterbacks because they've seen so much great quarterback play for so long, and everybody wants every quarterback that that you know straps that that helmet on to just be Sam Bradford day one. What have you made of the conversation on Jackson and, and some of the criticism of what we've seen from him, you know, through three games? Hey, man, this is this is the nature of the beast. This is mm -hmm. Oklahoma. I mean, you mentioned Sam Bradford. I mean, it's. It's Jason White. It's it's Sam Bradford. It's I mean the recent quarterback play that's been here with Baker Mayfield, with Kyler Murray, with Jalen Hurts, mm -hmm. uh, even Dylan Gabriel and what he was yeah. able to do last season. I mean, there's a high bar and high expectation, but you know that's why Jackson Arnold or anyone comes to Oklahoma. You embrace that, mm -hmm. like you know you don't you you should know what you're getting yourself into 
when you when you step foot on campus. So like, I mean, fans are fans are crazy. You know, if if you're not lighting it on fire, you know as well as I do, David. You've been doing this long enough. Like, all any fan wants to talk about is the backup quarterback or, or who, <laughs> who who should be coming in next. And uh, I think that he's handled all very well. I, mm-hmm. I think that. Oklahoma is no different than any major college football program. There's mm-hmm. there's high expectations, especially though, given the the last 20, 25 year run of success at that particular position mm-hmm. at the University of Oklahoma. There is a high bar, and if you're not living up to that, you know those expectations, living up to to that standard, well, everyone's going to be freaking out. So I think mm-hmm. that I think he's handled the best that he possibly can. And I think it's imperative that he doesn't allow that noise to affect his confidence or affect what he's doing out there on the field. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that's – and that's I, I, not just for Jackson, but that's for a lot of college football players now. You know, yeah. like with social media, it can get loud. Fortunately, I played in the dark ages. I played in the <laughs> early 2000s where there was no social media. But – you know, you could fill it in uh, when I was yeah. a player. You know, I remember my last year in 05, we lose to TCU in the opener in Norman. And we had just got back-to-back guy, national championships. And we're getting booed. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and Rhett Bomar is a freshman quarterback. And and he was kind of like kind of like Jackson. You know, he was like number one quarterback, five-star. And he yeah. was supposed to be able to do all these things. And, like, there was this expectation uh, to, to be great immediately and and you can feel the pressure it's just a different kind of pressure now than mm-hmm. it was then and and i think i think to to my knowledge and and based off what i've seen and my interaction with him he's done a good job not allowing that to affect him but i think that's that's a struggle for not just jackson arnold but, but players all across the country mm-hmm. well dusty finally before we let you go what's what's the blueprint to an ou uh Oh, you don't get a lot of chances to play spoiler, have upsets. What, what's, what's, the, what's the road to an OU upset on Saturday? How about this? This is the last time, uh, this is the, the first time Oklahoma's been an underdog at home of seven or more points since 1998, which... <laughs> that was the John Blake year, was it not? That was yeah. the final year of the John Blake era. The, which the year was, they did not speak of in Oklahoma. <laughs> which was rock bottom. Yeah, which is when yeah. Josh Heupel and Bob Stoops came in in 1999 and flipped the script. Yeah. So I mean, it, what we're seeing is not unprecedented, but it's been 25 years since mm-hmm. we've plus since we've seen a a home dog like this for Oklahoma. I think it's the the biggest spread I think I saw since like 1978 of a ranked Oklahoma team uh, that Oops. they're. You know, this big of a home underdog is a ranked team. So, like, yeah. you know, there, there's some interesting numbers going on here. But, again, I'll just say this. I get it. I, th- mm-hmm. I think Tennessee should be favored. I think Tennessee's mm-hmm. earned that. I think that they, coming in, have proven to be the more complete team. I, I, I don't want to just say, what's the recipe for an Oklahoma win? I think that one of the biggest things that I'm looking for in this game is can Oklahoma defensively can they limit and slow down Tennessee's rushing attack? Mm-hmm. And can they do it without overexposing themselves on the back end? Mm-hmm. That, that, that to me is going to be the, the biggest question mark I have because I think the thing that isn't talked about enough with Tennessee is the rushing attack. Dylan Sampson's got 300-yard games. He's got mm-hmm. nine touchdowns on the ground. I mean, they are averaging, I believe, David, you know better than me, seven-ish yards a carry as a team, mm-hmm. as a team. I think Dylan Sampson and Nico as a runner. That's the other thing about him that I don't know if he gets enough credit. He he can throw the football awesome. You know what he really scares me? As a runner, dude is fast. Yeah. When he gets downhill, like it's hard to account for. And you get mm-hmm. that extra hat. And so I think Oklahoma's ability to slow down Tennessee running the football and to do it with a six seven man box at most depending on what the personnel is for Tennessee if you've got to load up and you got to pack it in to stop this rushing attack i think it's going to be a long day cuz mm-hmm. Tennessee's got big receivers outside they got two guys that go 64 plus Bruce McCoy's ever been a 63 220 you got squirrel in there in the slot who just finds a way to get open like you don't you don't have the luxury i think to bring that extra hat down. You've got to keep mm-hmm. guys over the top and limit these explosives. 
if Oklahoma can limit Dylan Sampson, limit Nico in the rushing attack with a light box, I think it gives them the ability to have success, put Tennessee in third and predictable situations, allow that crowd, that atmosphere to come to life, and allow those pass rushers to potentially get home. Uh, but if Tennessee's lining up and running the football, I think it's going to be a long day. So that, that's the matchup I'm looking forward mm-hmm. to the most. Danny Stutzman, that front of Oklahoma, can they slow down Tennessee's ability to run the football? If they can, I think we're going to have a heck of a ball game. If they can't, yeah. it might be a long night for the Sooners. Yep. Well, Dusty, thanks for joining us. It's great to, great to talk to you. Great to catch up, man. It's going to be a memorable weekend, one way or the other, uh, in Norman for a lot of people. So thank you, Dusty. We appreciate it, man.